Monsters! We're, what? We're recording another fucking episode? Who's this? Another, who's, Rob Zombie? Did he actually calls himself that? Who the fuck names himself? Oh, I'm, I'm a zombie. I'm gonna come out and I'm gonna scare you. I ain't scared of nothing. What a fucking pussy this guy is. This piece of shit. He just, he puts on a bunch of makeup so he looks like some kind of ghoul or something. Then he straps on some kind of guitar. He, he performs music. Oh, he's a musician, Rob Zombie. What an artist. Last time I saw, the only musician worthy of the nickname RZ was Ronnie Van Zant. Oh, brother. you Am better fucking believe it, man. And also ZZ Top. Hey, fucking A, man. That's a great RZ. You fucking A, man. You keep trying this Rob Zombie shit. You want real scary? You come down to my house after midnight. You get the fuck off my property, Mr. Rob Zombie. I'll make you into what you think you is. You want real scary? You come into my house after midnight, take a look at my wife bent over, get a look up in them fucking guts, take a look at that little fucking twat, that big old butt of hers. Now that'll scare you. That'll scare you all the way down to Tennessee where you be drinking them grits down. Man, I didn't think you'd bring your wife into it, but you all right, man, man. Dottie sure got them folds of fat, baby. I don't even know how you find that shit, man, with your with your dick putting it there where hers is, but you can't find You got to roll that around flower just to find that shit. Oh, you damn right. She got Ben folds five, more like Dottie folds 25. Don't be na- don't be naming Yankee bands. I know to another me. fucking Come on, faggot. man. Jesus Christ. Sorry, Lord. Oh, good point. Good point. Yeah. yeah. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> I really do feel there's an opportunity there for some a great show. Ro- of full- Rob Zombie meeting his own character. Just a full length, yeah. I could do that all day brings out my imagination i don't like it because eventually i end up saying gay slurs yeah there'd have to be like a big uh uh caveat disclaimer before every show on itunes yeah yeah they're characters fictional characters being portrayed yeah but you know it's not a great thing maybe maybe we'll leave that behind the paywall henry oh well there's an idea oh Hey, uh, HP, Henry Papali on the GSP South over on the 6th. And over here is uh, the D train, uh, Daniel. Oh, I didn't think of anything this week. Scarenberg, man. I guess it's still Scarenberg. God, we can't get out of the land of scares. No. I am well, so sick of scares, thrills and chills and spills, Henry. Yeah. I'm ready to just see some characters having a nice convo. Just some talking. Going to the bank. Yeah. Yeah. And not, I, not robbing it. Just, no, no, no. Just, just going, taking out some money to take their wife to dinner. Yeah. That's I'll what like I'd that. like to see. You should watch that movie from the 90s, 20 Bucks. What's that movie? It's a movie that follows a $20 bill around town. We loved that in the 90s. I think it's because of Forrest Gump and that feather. Probably, probably. There was also yeah. a Robert Altman miniseries in the 90s called Gun that I watched at, when I was way too young, and it w- it gave me little baby boners, dude. Like, big-time little baby boners, like memorable ones. And gun? Gun. And the premise of the show, it was like six episodes, and it followed a gun, like from hand to hand, you know? Oh, Wow. I, I don't know. At one I don't point, that I think all. like a sexy Secret Service had it. Sure. Yeah, a lot of <laughs> yeah. women handling it and scantily clad. It was clothes. like that. It had the same. Robert Altman. Yeah, he produced it. It he, oh, it had the dude. same vibe as like um, Tales from the Crypt, but without the the Spook Master himself, the Chill Goblin. What's his name? Right. The Crypt Keeper. <laughs> Well, he made a cameo uh, last week in House of One Thousand and One Corpses. Did he? 
We saw the chill master. He's Dr. Satan, remember? He's he that's him. The Crypt Keeper? My... Yeah, that's Dr. Satan. It's the same look. I guess I oh I, I mean sort of. I don't really know about that. Well, I said it last week. Yeah, yeah. He's just like a but which will he address looks like I feel like Dr. Satan looked like an event horizon character. I think you and I are are confusing who Dr. Satan is. He's the guy who's attached to the metal things doing surgeries. Okay, yeah. Just a skeleton to me. But, he didn't look like But he looked like a large bat because of those contraptions. Oh, I guess that's that's true. Yeah. You don't want to mess I, with a large bat, man. I oh, oh. scare. <laughs> I scare <clears throat> criminals fear the dark. I will become a bat because, as a coincidence, when I was thinking about fighting vigilante crime, a bat flew through my apparently extremely flimsy windows. Master Bruce, I have a question for you. Uh, you know, bats really aren't that scary. Do, do you think that this, 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 you, you should really go as an animal? I've settled on bat. There's no talking you out of this particular... I'm solid on bat. <laughs> Okay, I've just I've landed just... here on bat, and this is where I will stay. Okay, I mean, I was just, at least maybe like a spider, a tiger, you know, it's a bit, I don't know. Just... A Spider Man? That'll never work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Henry, we have fun here. We Let's, do. We're talking about the Devil's Rejects and uh, also uh, Three from Hell. Not the three you're thinking about. Two of the ones you're thinking about, but uh, there's a third one. And there is. There is. This is brought to us by Padovano, our games master. Yes. Kyle P. Dot to his homies. <laughs> and, right, uh, Kyle P. Dot. Yeah, we've talked to him on the Discord. Why? I mean, we've gone through some tough times. We've commiserated with Kyle P. Dot. Why give us further tough times? Yeah, yeah, I know. You wonder about that sometimes if if any of that goes into play. But uh, I like to think of the benevolence of our benefactors and think that it's just purely that they want to hear us talk, not to they, intentionally torture us. Yeah, they want to hear what they want to hear, but I don't understand what they want to hear is so frequently us... Trashing their taste. Yeah. Yeah. It is an, it is an interesting dichotomy. I, I don't know if 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 I would follow the same pattern if I was if I wanted to hear someone talk about something I loved, but I thought they'd hate it. I don't know if I I'd think want to hear I that. would pick something that I love that has variable quality, you know? Yeah. Like if you and I each had a show about music. I don't think, even though I value and would want your opinion on lots of type of music, I don't think I would intentionally assign you to give you uh, something I know you'd hate. Well, Henry, occasionally we do have a show about music, and you've That's assigned me to listen to your favorite band. And yours to me. That's right. Check out Pave CDC on the Franchise <laughs> Network. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but we came to that agreement too together that we would each agree that we 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 were we knew we'd find enough enjoyment out Common of each other. ground. Ground. All right, let's talk Doesn't about uh, some common ground that I have with Kyle P. Dot, and that's the Devil's Rejects, which to me is uh, easily the crown jewel of the Firefly family franchise. Uh, it's episode 234. Great. Just just to let everybody know. Let Papali. Olivia know for the website. Yep, Papali, <laughs> Scarenberg, we're all here. Um, <laughs> Zombie directed it and wrote it, auteur. Uh, released July 22nd, 2005. A mere day after Henry turned uh, probably... Hang on. I'm going to say... You know this. 27. Yes. Okay. 
And it I wasn't. Had a, I knew what year you were born, Henry. It's yeah. merely a struggle with my math skills. I know. I, I actually knew that. Um, yeah, that was a fun birthday. I had some people over in the Bronx. That was a fun one. I remember that birthday quite well. Before I knew you. That's right. A few years before did we you knew get, each other. Did you get your dick wet that night? With my girlfriend, sure. The next yeah. morning, you woke up hungover. Um, you washed off your dick. And then did you go see the Devil's Rejects in theaters? I, I do not believe so. Mm. This was not something that would, would have been on my radar at the time. Yeah. And what a radar you've always had, Henry. Well, I'll say that I fucking have. Oh. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. I did want to mention something uh, before uh, we really get going. We're off and running already. I, I know that. Um, oh, my God. I know. We're cooking at this point. We're cooking. We started with the Southern thing, and then we took a little dip, uh, and now we're at what I like to call like a moderate creek flow. When we'll you say a little and... dip, are you saying that you've been chewing tobacco? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. obviously for this episode. Uh, I would also like to point out that there will be a superhero count, and I would also like to point out that it took me almost one hour and 30 minutes. Why? To Just I, I say because, Henry, you can do half the superhero count and say, fuck you, Kyle, like halfway through and get I and everyone will get the same level I, of enjoyment. I can't do that to Kyle. You know, he paid Why not. He paid. <laughs> Kyle is scum, Henry. He lives in Florida. <laughs> anyway, um, it's very thorough. Uh Thankfully, we will not be returning to the superhero count for a for a very long time, um, and that's going to be fun. Uh, there's twelve for one movie, and seven for another. That's too many. Why yes, are I all know. these superhero franchises hiring Rob Zombie's crew? Or why is he hiring them? I don't know. Well, I have answers for some of them, Henry. Okay. All right. Rejects. Uh, Seven twenty two oh five budget of seven million dollars, uh, Bafo Bio of twenty point nine million dollars, and uh, it came in at number one hundred and twenty four at the two thousand five box office, right there between Kung Fu Hustle and future episode Son of the Mask. <laughs> okay, sure, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 right. You know it. All right, so um. I mean, let's get into it, Henry. Uh, I, okay. So I saw this movie around that time. It, I saw it before I saw House of a Thousand, of 1,000 Corpses, um, based on its trailers, which looked cool to me. Mm -hmm. You know? There's a lot of sand. I like a desert <clears throat> horror movie. Well, I love, I was thinking about that last night. I, I'm a sucker for a climate, certain climates and movies. You know, yeah, deserts and, and snow. I like the extremes. I love movies like no, in the no. Antarctica. Take, take me out of the snow. I don't like that. It makes love me it. think of winter. I love like it. to be in a hot climate. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. But I have yeah. trouble with uh, Fargo as a TV show sometimes for that reason. Like, it's like I could take it for two hours, but I can't tune in every week to watch all that snow. Really? Yeah. yeah I don't, cold. I don't, I like it. I don't have an aversion like you do. Yeah, well, yeah. also, this season's just been bad. But it's anyway, great. Finished up last night. Great finale. Ooh, yeah. Uh, so anyway, I, I I saw this one, okay? Yes. Then, and I, and I liked it. I liked it okay. all right. And then I saw 1,000 Corpses. Didn't like that one as much. So I rewatched this movie for the first time since it came out earlier. Wow. This year. Oh. Okay. Okay. And got so it. I got to be honest, this rewatch was a little difficult for me. I did not have the distance required. No, that's, yeah, that's tough. I mean, when did you watch it earlier this I'm year? I'm looking at Letterbox March 24th. Mm, that's not a lot of time. A mere. Mm. Like nine months. Eight months. 
Yeah, someone's We're pregnant. both sort of struggling time. with math today. Yeah, someone was pregnant at the time you watched it, and now then they're— Then today they could be delivering a beautiful premature baby. That's correct. That's correct. That, that's what I was going to say, but it didn't. I didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so the movie opens with sort of a scroll. It's like— um, it's trying to do the Texas Chainsaw Massacre scroll. They even got Barry Bostwick doing it. Um, then it's sort of a previously on the Devil's Rejects. We're we're making an effort to rebrand them, the Devil's Rejects. I don't think we mention a House of a Thousand Corpses in this one. Yes, uh, we'll get into that. You are right. I had to think if we. Well, I mean, it's. That's a big part of my opinion. So, I mean, I want to ask you right off the bat. I mean, it's it's mentioned in that it takes place right after that. And it is in a lot of it. The house is shown. But you're in terms of Dr. Satan and some of the perhaps supernatural occurrences going on. Uh, you're right. I mean, I I took this as Rob Zombie essentially and weirdly wanting to pretend he kind of hadn't made that first one. It's because... weird because he seems really proud of that film, and he's chosen to sequelize it only two years later, but he also seems like a little embarrassed of it, where he's like, all that silly shit from that movie, we're not going to talk about. Like, it right. was just like a crazy killer family living in that house. Yeah, and I feel, and I feel, I felt and I still feel that Three from Hell and Devil's Rejects, they suffer because I cannot get House of 1000 Corpses out of my head as the starting point. I thought Three from Hell was actually a weird – I mean, and we'll get to it a lot more, obviously. But I thought it was sort of an attempt to – coalesce the franchise and to make it 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 was at least an attempt to convince more that devil's rejects and house of a thousand corpses take place on the same timeline yeah you're right you're right uh it's it's interesting though because i guess his style changes so dramatically from the first movie to the third movie, the narrative changes so dramatically, and he clearly, clearly, clearly wanted these characters to be different people than they already were established in the first one. Because mm-hmm. they are so different. I mean, maybe with the exception of... Sid Haig. Yes. I mean, Baby is even different. The most notably and most improved character being Bill Mosley. Well, I, I said that. I I wondered if you'd feel that way. Because oh, it's it, undeniable. It, it seems like a, a revamped character from the ground up. Completely. Like, he's kept his sort of high higher-pitched voice, and he still monologues about, like, murdering people sometimes, but with more of a focus. Um, yeah. uh, but, I mean, it's pretty much a reworked character. I think it's completely reworked. And, it, and, and it's weird. Like, instead of uh, giving him the fright wig that he had in the first movie, it's yeah. almost like Rob Zombie has brought Bill Mosley back and asked him to cosplay as Rob Zombie. Yes, with the beard and everything. I didn't even think of that. Yeah, actually, in the still that's on when you watch it, mm-hmm. it looks like Rob. He looks like Rob Zombie. He does. He I can't look at the Devil's Rejects poster without just seeing sherry moon Sid Haig and rob zombie yeah 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 completely yeah it's weird he could hire out bill mosley as like um like saddam hussein did you know like no, ha- no. <laughs> you know how he used to hire just like dudes who looked like him to watch oh yeah him? yeah to be his body double sure yeah yeah to, to be assassination fodder that's right <laughs> on the front lines uh-huh all right, so um, we check in with the with the DR, the uh, daughters of the American Revolution. No, the uh, the Devil's Rejects, and they are uh, getting arrested basically at the beginning of this movie. <laughs> William Forsyth plays a new character, a sheriff. They solve the case. They find all the great corpses. And all 1,000 of them. 
all 1,000, a lot of toe tagging, a lot of bagging. Uh, I will point out a Keith point that I really found funny, which still doesn't make sense because I, you know, as you said last week, I may or may not hate this movie, and um, but it may make more more sense. And one of the funniest things was it it says it's like seven months after that these cops descend on this place. What the fuck took so long? I, I when they came on and it said I was like I thought. You sure it's not seven hours? Yeah. Like seven months it took to find these people? Yeah. It, it, excuse me if I'm, rem- I'm misremembering, but in House of a Thousand Corpses, <laughs> uh, they were looking for a bunch of missing teenagers. They went to a house. They found the car of the missing teenagers. Then yeah. they sent in three police officers who uh, all disappeared. <laughs> Presumably they know... That those cops were going to that house. Yeah, this wasn't vigilante justice. They were Uh, on a police mission. They were on a CB radio. Clearly, they would have said, you know, Dolores, uh, this is Wydell. I'm heading over to the uh, House of a Thousand Corpses. Uh, (laughs) If I'm not back, send a posse. Yeah. I think. But I guess not. You send, send in Toby and Leo and the boys. Something. That's my favorite posse. I know it is. Yeah. yeah. Well, you could you could send the pussy posse in this movie, that's for sure. Toby and Leo show up. Yeah. Or Lawrence Fishburne, right? He was he in Posse? Oh yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that movie? I do. Yeah. See what they were doing there was they were playing on the idea that in the old West they would call like a group of men a posse, right? right but right. then in the 90s in hip hop culture, black men would refer to a large group of their friends as being in their posse. True. Put that together, a bunch of black guys in the old west, you got yourself a 90s movie called Posse. You do. Is that not Mario Van Peebles work? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Seems like a Van Peebles. Yeah. That rascal. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh so they get uh arrested basically the mom gets arrested actually and uh uh fucking baby and uh johnny mosley what's his name otis. Ba- baby and otis get... oh, baby and otis right they get away yeah, yeah everyone else uh, bites it uh rufus uh i mean most of the people we don't even check in with there's like a billion maniacs in the basement that presumably just get arrested immediately that's another point that's another point that's right what happened to those guys yeah i mean are there enough handcuffs in this town yeah they're gonna need to get some they're gonna need to outsource some resources i just feel like this is more of an fbi situation where you call down true this is like a waco situation we gotta take down that firefly family yeah it's not we're gonna need our best men michael shannon john leguizamo yeah yeah a very good show by the way yeah all right henry meanwhile sid haig we meet him and he's fucking uh, the elderly porn star Ginger Lynn. Um, I think for real. <laughs> you do not. I kind of do. Really? Is, is a zombie, he would do that? Yes. Intercourse on, on camera. He's already hired this trashy ass porn, like just the most disgusting porn star you can find. <laughs> and. Like, thrown her on top of a pantsless Sid Haig. Like, I mean, what, is the porn star going to complain? Like, this is a real movie. I'm not going to fuck this time. I mean, maybe. She's been fucking for a living for the last 50 I... years. <laughs> <laughs> Ginger Lynn literally been in porn since 1955. <laughs> you can find old Tijuana Bibles with Ginger Lynn. <laughs> This just in, the President Roosevelt issuing a ban on all comic book pornography sales. Ginger Lynn, suspected in the strip reel, black and white, is Walter Winchell for Ginger Lynn. 
People don't know that Stormy Daniels was only the second porn star scandal in presidential history. FDR right. had an affair with Ginger Lynn. Yeah, so did Rutherford B. Hayes. She's been around a long time, man. She's been around that block, Pennsylvania Avenue. 1600, <laughs> 1600 times, if you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, baby. Oh, so Sid Haig is penetrating her pussy and um, having a real nice time. But then it turns out that he was dreaming. Right. He wakes up from a dream. And in fact, he has a big, fat, ugly lady next to him. That's correct. And that's, that's funny. Correct. That's nice. Yeah. yeah. Um. So he's mean to her because these movies are misogynistic. I mean, these movies... I'm I'm going to say this because the movies are just trashy. Like I'm not complaining that it's misogynistic gen- in in general because yeah. like that's what it's going for. Yeah. Ultimately. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's sort yeah, of I mean, easy to take here. I mean it, except when like I didn't maybe need him to put his uh, gun down that girl's underpants later in the movie. Yeah. There's there's a lot of uh, and then tell her husband that his gun now <laughs> smells like her stank. Yeah, I know, man. There's there's a lot of torture of women in this movie, and the guys are relegated more to either being humiliated or just punched. I like how Zombie gets away with it by putting his wife in the movie. It's like, see, this guy's not a misogynist. Yeah. Right there on the screen is his healthy relationship. Well, that's what I thought you were going to say. I thought you were going to say, like, at your first, when you first were saying it, I thought you were going to say, well, I don't want to call him a misogynist because he, he does have his wife there and gives her a bunch of stuff. But, you know, come on. I just want to call him a good husband. I'm very that's moved fine. by fine. Rob Zombie's continuing faith in Sherry Moon. Really? Yeah, I mean, she doesn't have any skills that we know of. Um, and he keeps, like, putting her in central roles in motion pictures. Yeah. That's nice. That's a good husband. Yeah. I think he doesn't know that she's bad. Like, he loves her so much. I think you're probably right. Yeah. I mean, he's certainly not the only filmmaker to put his significant other in lead roles no of course not but i think i think his faith in her is astonishing i can't think of another uh filmmaker who so consistently puts their untalented spouse in important roles in movies his entire career rests on sherry moon's talent you didn't hear what i said oh you said mia farrow yeah i mean yeah he used her a lot but I was she, never she's so good, though. I'm a Diane Keaton guy, but anyway, Ooh, um, listen to this guy. I am. You I don't, think you don't like that better. coldness. You don't I like don't... that. Like if you're gonna lay down in bed next to her, it'd be like a wax figurines next to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But no, I guess you're right. I mean, I. I, I guess I just looked at it. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I mean, I, I think he does think there's a lot of talent going on there, and they're married, and they probably are very in love. And uh, so he just wants to you put her in the movies. I'm sure she's happy to do it. Clearly. Um, although, as we learned from her website, she's quite a busy lady. What did we learn from that website? I forgot to go on it. She's got a lot of products. What kind uh, of products? Uh, you know, uh, talisman, oh. uh, <laughs> like crystals, that kind of a thing. Yeah, you know, a lot of like pit photographs and t- you know that kind of thing. You know, she seems like a very. Ni- I made fun of her last week, kind of mercilessly, but she seems like a very nice person. I'm sure that honest. she is such a nice lady, Henry. Seems fine. Yeah. I, I, sometimes I feel bad because you know I know that celebrities listen to our show on the regs all the time. Yeah, yeah. Is it so just gotta, SherryMoonZombie.com? It's not just, working. Just, just go to her wiki page. That's and it's right there. Her That's wiki how I found page. It. Yeah. It's oh, on here there. it is. A, here it is. Um. Yep. She's got like a headshot right there. Yep. Um. She's plugging her pug Godzilla and her cat Renfield. Ren. Now that's a Dracula reference. That's right. That's right. She has a 
tattoo here she posted that somebody has of the devil's rejects. Yeah. Now I noticed they have Sid Haig on there. Do you think anybody got a tattoo of Richard Brake? <laughs> <laughs> I I I would bet they did. <laughs> it's just a Tumblr. Yeah, I see. She sells some yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. She posts yeah. some like fan art. It's nice. Yeah. It is nice. It's fine. Oh, she sells vegan pizzas. I wonder if she's vegan. I would imagine that would have made her want to sell them. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right and has, has, has of animals don't eat them i think that's probably an indicator yeah so everybody gets away um uh haig calls up his old pal a strip club owner and says we're gonna make our way down there uh not a strip club a brothel you know and kind of his brother i would assume oh yeah yeah there's something to that too what's his name the ken forey is the actor we've come across him i feel like um in maybe Halloween, something like that. Um, but the, another weird thing I couldn't really figure out was that, you know, uh, Dr. Earl, Dr. Satan's helper in the first movie, is said, was he said to be the stepfather of Baby and Otis or the real father? It's very confusing because. Captain Spaulding is clearly the father of Baby, but he doesn't seem like he's the father. I don't of think that Captain Spaulding's the father of Baby. Of either of them? I don't think so, no. Okay. Because Otis calls him Cutter. He won't call him Dad, but, but Baby says it a lot. But I think Baby calls every guy Daddy. It just seemed like they were family to me. I, I couldn't... No, they're family. They're the Firefly family. I, I think that... In my mind, the mom is was a prostitute. That's established. Right. I don't think the dad matters too much. Like, I'm sure yeah. they were raised with Sid Haig in the house and with uh, that okay. old guy. I don't yes. know, Henry. Uh, the, the, the fucking... Who cares? Because they bring it up. It's, it's a constant theme throughout both mo- all three movies, so that's why I asked. What, and, Family? Uh, no, like the way they interact with each other and are always saying over and over. And then we meet Break, and he's supposed to be another I, I don't want to talk about him yet. That's oh. a whole fucking can of worms that I'm not ready to open. Uh-oh. That's Joe Chill, motherfucker. Yeah, I know. All right, so uh, Forsyth turns out to be the brother of the uh, cop from the first one. It's... Uh, you know, the old Die Hard with a Vengeance. Usually it takes them, uh, the third movie, to run out of ideas. Here we're going with the second one. That's right. Um, it, you know, it's a vigilante thing. He's after them. They're on the run. Meanwhile, Mosley and Baby, they hole up in a strip motel. And yeah. uh, they sort of kidnap a family band, <laughs> like a vocal yeah. band. They're yeah. like the a Starlight vocal band or something yeah. like, from Afternoon Delight. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. Um, yeah, I, I felt like that whole part had things about it that I liked and things about it that I really hated. And one that I liked, which was, it was for me the first indication that this one of the first indications is this was not going to be a house of a thousand corpses type of thing because there was some talking and some dialogue and some people in different settings. Yeah. Good, and, good, and, funny dialogue and yeah. character actors delivering them. Right. A lot of character actors. Yeah. Not just and, bullshit higher horror icons that Rob Zombie liked when he was 14. That's right. Um, but then when we got to the hotel room and it just kind of starts to be like a torture fest, I just really started being reminded of the limitations of his ideas in certain scenarios, whereas like it just it was just tedious after a while because, you know, already know you already one of the problems you already know, nobody in that band is going to live. So it, since it's a foregone conclusion it's kind of just like you're just waiting for it to end. And it's just a matter of watching him, Rob Zombie, direct how he's going to off these people. Yeah, but I I did think it was a smart move to have Mosley go walk a couple of them off to a different location. 
That, yes, that well, adds that... some spice to it, and that was yeah. a good little sequence. With uh, so the the band, it's Jeffrey Lewis, Juliet's great father. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Then you've got uh, Priscilla Presley. What's her name? Priscilla Barnes from, from Plain Three's Strange Company. <laughs> Who's she in Plain Strange and Automobiles? She's Steve Martin's wife. Oh, hey. Yeah. Also, um, the three nippled psychic in Mallrats. That's right. And uh, then it's uh, some girl. <laughs> this yeah, is like pretty much. Yeah. A younger girl. And Brian Posehn as their roadie. <laughs> Brian Posehn. <laughs> it's fun to see Brian Posehn yeah. pop up in a movie like this. Sure. I know, you know, it's not that surprising because he's always been a very outspoken fan of like the horror metal milieu. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. you know, it's still he's a friendly face for me. I yeah, always me find too. him funny and enjoyable. So do I. I like his stand up. I've liked his appearances on uh, what Tim and Eric. I think everywhere. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, he's cool. He that pops was fun. up and shit. Just shoot me. Remember, he was on Just Shoot Me. Yeah, episode seven, season four. No, he was on like a lot of episodes. He was like the mail guy who would deliver the mail sometimes. Here's and, your mail. And then you know David Spade would make like snarky jokes about, oh, he looks like fucking Frankenstein over here. <laughs> don't make of fun. Of, don't, don't make fun of the Spadester. Well, I, 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 God, I can't even poke fun at David Spade. You're going to come to his defense that quick? It's David Spade. Yeah, you can make fun of him. Thank you. I, I don't care. Um, so then, so in that sequence, they are torturing them. Henry wasn't into it. To me, it didn't quite wear out its welcome in the same way some sequences in the first movie did. Um, I said I could live without some of the sexualization. Although I did like when he goes to uh, retrieve her from the shower. <laughs> you know, it, it just at that point, the movie really started to remind me of um, a movie, another movie. I, well, a movie I really don't like. Um, I believe you do like it, as does most as do most people. But it really reminded me like that Rob Zombie was trying to really go for his own version of natural born killers and oh, yeah. or, and or a great movie california i knew you're gonna say fucking california it's so... i just occurred to me actually yeah, that, yeah that's totally what he's going for that like traveling through the desert doing crazy shit like killing people no morals fuck the world yeah with trashy characters too trashy people like and no, no, trying nobody to, empathetic and trying to turn it into a comedy I don't think there's nobody empathetic in this movie. Well, but, the protagonists certainly are not. No, but and, like the Jeffrey Lewis character is really sweet. Yes, right. But what I what I mean is a recurring issue for me throughout the next two is that I I'm not really sure. Well, I do I do think at a certain point in Devil's Rejects. I mean, you're supposed to be, if not empathizing, you're supposed to be rooting for these three people, and. I, I, I don't know how I'm supposed to do that, given what's gone well, on. Just because you know that they're going to get... Wait, you think you're you're supposed to be rooting for the Firefly family? Yeah. I mean, I don't believe that to be true in this movie. No. I do in no. Three from Hell. It, yeah. it's, I, I think that Rob Zombie roots for them. I think that his love for these characters is definitely on the screen and in some cases a hindrance to the film. But yeah. um, but I do think like he's learned a lot of lessons from movie one to movie two, where like the victims of the Firefly family in movie one were depicted as just being like heartless piece of shit shrews that like you couldn't wait to see die. Yeah. Whereas in this one, he took the time to establish that like folk singing group as like yeah. characters before putting I agree. them in the situation, and yeah. you, you know. You're, you know they're gonna die, but you'd prefer that they wouldn't be killed. Correct. I I, I agree. Uh, it, it's more just like a, a, a confirmation towards the middle and towards the end of the movie where it just felt like we're getting a lot of sort of indications that like in another movie like let's you know Bonnie and Clyde or 
you know, other movies where there's criminals and you want them to make it, which is a very common emotion and very cine- constant cinematic trope. It was weird to watch one where I wasn't sure how on earth I, if indeed the intention was for us to root for them, how I would want them to like, especially at the end with the free bird and the standoff, like how am I supposed to be feeling like I would? Well, I think that's why it's the perfect end for that movie, because if you're somebody who was never able to get on board with them as characters, then you see them die in a hell of, of bullets. And that's the end of the film. And that's the end of the franchise for at least 15 years. And then like, or if you're a fan of it, you can see it as they could have survived and like, oh, please make a third one, our hero, Rob Zombie. But isn't the poignancy of the ending a little bit lessened, like, by the fact, by that fact? Like, I mean, how did you feel? I and mean, I know we're not even there yet. If you want to wait, we can wait. But, like, the poignancy of what he's doing, because what he's doing, I think, is very cool. I actually liked the stopping in the highway and despite my hatred of that song it's an incredible song and it's so well used i i don't really like freebird uh but yeah it's very well used but i feel like i wish i had some emotional investment in it it would be so much more powerful if it was like a swan song that i cared about these you know what i mean but it's like kind of lingering on their faces like in this very romantic way the camera and it's just kind of like it's really overdone but i i think really it, overdone but i think that it, it's done in an, an ironic way like the sort of majesty that it's presented in is at odds with who these people are i didn't think that was intentional i, I did okay yeah i didn't feel i think it. it's consistently intentional in this movie i i think three from hell lost me a lot of the time because in a lot of these like montages that Rob Zombie loves to do because lazy filmmakers know that they can throw a great song over a bunch of images and it adds power to a scene that wouldn't normally have it. Um, in, the th- in Three from Hell, a lot of times they are just like what the emotion we're supposed to feel is look how badass they are. Yeah. And in, in yeah. this, it's more like look at these pathetic creeps. That's interesting. I I think that I because I fundamentally I, I think you give you're in you're inclined to give Rob Zombie a more intelligent benefit of the doubt, and I'm I, not I, only because that's the film that was presented to us here. I I think this is a right. consi- a, a film with a consistent tone and ideas, and. The first one's a mess. Like, that's a first-time filmmaker yeah. throwing shit at the wall. Everything but the kitchen sink or whatever. This is a movie by, like, a guy who's, like, got a movie to make. And I, I think it's consistent all the way through. And I do think that he consistently judges these characters. Like, we can joke about, like, Sid Haig waking up from a dream of fucking a porn star and being with, like, a fat girl. And then, like, he, like, big ups himself by, like, shitting on her or whatever. But also... Like, this is a pathetic character. He's, like, a fucking evil party clown who, like, lives in a roadside, like, attraction and, like, fucks, you know, gross girls. Like, gross trailer trash or whatever. And I think that's the character. It's the only one who's ever, who ever receives any sort of affection from anybody in like mainstream society is baby. And it's only because she's like a beautiful woman. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I just, I don't, I mean, I think again, that the whole reading of him as what you said is all accurate. I just don't, I did not get the vibe or impression that Rob zombie doesn't fucking love this guy and wants us to love him too. But I don't think, I, I think both can be true. Yeah, well, they have to be because we had different interpretations of it completely. So, but, yeah. But, no, no, I think, I think both interpretations are accurate. Yeah, I know. He I'm wants agreeing. us to love these characters, but I don't think he isn't judging them. Okay. It was, it's hard for me to see that, that, that judgment, but whatever. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, what, what do you want to talk about next? 
So he walks him out. He kills the guy. What's their next adventure after that? I mean, he. Uh, I thought that killing scene was interesting too because he first makes Jeffrey Lewis pl- pray to God. Yeah. And then when he kills him, it's almost like a fuck you. Like we're actually about the devil. And it's kind of it, like it's the first sense that these characters have any ideology in any of these movies. Like up to this point, they've just been like maniacs. And in this particular moment, Bill Mosley is espousing like Satan, Satanist ideology. Yeah. Whereas in the first one, there was just like these, we talked about it last week, but like just these maniacal ramblings that just are supposed to be pseudo profound and they're not. And in this one, I think that Bill Mosley benefits greatly from having room to breathe and and I'm, by that I even mean the atmosphere, like being outside, getting to see his face clearly. Uh, he's a really good actor. I actually really liked him. I mean, I, I like as an actor. Uh, like I love his delivery of lines. He's very natural. I think he's kind of funny. He's and, I great. Mean, he's he, you know, there's a great sequence in this movie where they're driving. Uh, away, like it's when Sid Haig gets them after they kill all the vocal people and they're going to drive over to that brothel. Yeah. And on the way, uh, Baby and Sid Haig are asking to stop for ice cream yeah. and Bill Mosley won't. And they're, they're chanting tutti fucking fruity, tutti fucking fruity. <sighs> and there's like a real sitcom moment where Bill Mosley's like, yeah. We're not stopping for ice cream. And then it's like a cut and they're like yeah. licking ice cream cones. Very obvious. And yeah. it's yeah. so it's such a sweet little sitcom moment in the middle of this movie that is only funny because of Bill Mosley's reaction work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he I, I think of the three, he's the best one by a lot. No, I Sid mean, Haig's I, the best one. By I don't way. agree with that. I'm not really in the Sid Haig crowd camp. I know everyone fucking loves him. I he just, rules. He's so fucking vile. I just, I can't even... Like, <laughs> yeah, I, that's why he's great. He's like a John to, Waters like, character. Yeah, he is. Uh, by the way, I remembered him while I was watching this and when I was watching House of a Thousand Corpses in <laughs> Jackie Brown. That's what I remember him fucking. What from. does he do in that movie? He's the judge who sentences Jackie to uh, to prison before she gets bailed out. Wow, that's it, wild. That's what I remember him as because I didn't see him in a lot of these things that he was made famous for. Yeah, did he get? Um, did he? Was he in the Oscar in memoriam? Did he make that? He should have, but I highly doubt it. Yeah, I'd like to, someone to let me know about that. Anyway, um, so yeah, uh, he he puts Jeffrey Lewis's face onto Priscilla Barnes's face. It's very nice. And that's yeah. great. And then that's a great scene, actually. I found that genuinely spooky with her running around, like trying to get somebody's attention, but they're all just like freaked out by this <laughs> bloody woman screaming. Yeah, I, well, I didn't see that coming. I knew he would do something horrific. I kind of I... thought like a, a stranger, like a passerby was going to shoot her. Yeah, yeah. And then she just, I mean, that could have been something more, but they just have her. She gets flattened by a truck. By truck. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, around here is where I am going to uh, bring in my favorite scene in the movie, which Kyle Padovano told me is his least favorite scene in the movie. Oh. Okay, so right. they figure out that the names of all the Firefly family are taken from Marx Brothers movies. Yeah, yeah. And Zombie brings in a film critic to talk to William Forsyth and discuss Groucho Marx. And it is a very silly movie and uh, uh, scene. And to me, what it is, it's like a Mayor Ebert from Godzilla, where it's a filmmaker who's been thrashed by the critics, putting in a character like, look, this is you. You guys are yeah. fucking nerds. And yeah. I usually hate this. Um, yes. Obviously, the entire movie Birdman is just a screed against critics, and I hate that movie. Excuse me, Birdman or The Unexpected Virtue of Ignorance. And um, I think 
this actually works for me. I I find it funny. I, I this think, kind of is what what film nerds are like. Yeah, yeah, they cite off a lot of stuff. I mean, we do that shit, but yeah, the 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 only thing about it that is silly. I mean, it is it isn't a bad scene. It held my attention. Like I was like, oh, what what was annoying was that it was it felt like when Rob Zombie did this with the characters' names it felt like sort of an example of what you and I were mocking about him last week, where it's like you go to his apartment. Let's who are we kidding? His, his mansion. And you'll see all these books and these films. And then in the corner, you'll see something kind of like prestigious. So then you'll see like the Marx brothers. It's Mm -hmm. like, Oh, Rob zombie appreciates duck soup. And so it was just kind of like, uh, that was tough for me because I was just like, oh, come on, man. Like, you're not, what are you trying to tell me now? You're trying to tell me that you have elevated uh, cinematic comedic Well, I mean, it's also a reference that for anybody who got it in the first movie, in this one, it's like, (laughs) hey, by the way, I'm going to tell you about it. I was referencing the Marx Brothers in that movie. But that scene's all right. I mean, we didn't even mention, in not only in that scene, but we barely mentioned, I mean... William Forsyth, man. I mean, I'm I'm always thrilled to see him anytime. And what do we know William Forsyth from? Oh my God! I, I mean, I know he's, he's in Dick Tracy. I remember, that's my prime William Forsyth. Dude, he, he, he's in so much stuff. I mean, look him up. I mean, he, he he's in uh, he's in a villain in one of the Seagal movies. He's in The Rock. He's really good. Um, he's in Raising he, Arizona. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, right, right, right. He's John Goodman's partner. I mean, he's been showing up in stuff for 40 years. Sure, um, yeah. He's in lots of films that I've seen, Henry. Uh, yeah. He played Al Capone in the Untouchables TV show. Yeah, I, I read that. And he was in Boardwalk Empire as as the Jewish uh, butcher character, I believe. Sure. Yeah. Um, He's oh, yeah, just I kind of remember that. He was badass yeah. on Boardwalk he's Empire. Mitchie, I think his name was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he's just he's just great, and I think that was a catch to get him in this in this movie. And, I mean, I like him in this movie. I mean, he's tough to like, but, again, he's playing against such despicable people. By the way, speaking of casting choices, I did prefer uh, by a lot the Leslie woman who Easterbrook yeah, yeah, plays Karen Black. Now, what do we know her from? Mean nothing. Really? I, I didn't know. I didn't. Leslie I mean, I Easterbrook. Let's see. She's in Police Academy. I think that's her big claim to fame. Oh, yeah. Are you a fan? She's in a lot of the Police Academies. That's what she's known for, dude. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. She's in all oh. seven. God damn it. She stuck around. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, she she did. Boy, and she was this was 15 years ago. So she was like 50 something when this movie came out. Yeah. Huh. All right. So yeah, anyway, I like this. I, I, this big improvement. It was 6 of one half a dozen of the other for me. Either way, it's fine. With with the actress in that role? Yeah. I think Karen Black would have been able to pull off being a little bit more so, you know, this actress has reminded me of Faye Dunaway, too. She fucking looked like her in some of those scenes. It was really weird. And, I mean, I I did like William Forsythe kind of treading the line between the law and not being... Oh, it was vigilante you know, justice, for yeah. sure. Uh, and when he gets her in the cell, I mean, th- those are some and pretty interesting... she tries interesting... to get a little sexy with him. You yeah, know what yeah. I noticed is uh, she's got nice teeth in this movie. In the in the uh, in House yeah. of One Thousand Corpses, they really like like nastied up. Um, what's her face's teeth? Karen Black. Karen yeah. Black. I, I noticed the teeth are very variable in this franchise because they made Mama Firefly's teeth better in this movie, but they made Sid Haig's teeth much worse. Worse. Yeah. Yeah. He hasn't been brushing in the intervening two years or seven months without brushing or flossing uh and i think also that's probably got to do with the way zombie wants to shoot his films i mean it's a clearer looking film the shots are more thought out uh 
you get to see people's faces more. And he has more money, I think. Than he's he, using a nice grainy film stock. It's the same budget. He's just allocating the money better. He's allocating the money better. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's there's less distracting. Because well, the, all the money in the first movie went to bullshit production design, dude. Yes, right, exactly, and I think he's allocating more money to just little things here and there that that do make it a little more coherent, a lot more coherent um, of a movie. But yeah. indeed, so we drive over to Charlie's Frontier Fun Town, which is the name of the brothel area. There's yeah. Ken Forey, um, the uh, his his bottom bitch, his head prostitute. As uh, that's a great term, Henry. Is um, what's the actress's name? I know her as the voice of Tommy Pickles from the animated series Rugrats. The actress's <laughs> name. That is hundred percent true. I believe you. Um... Is that E.G. Daly? E.G. Daly. Kate? She's a great yeah. voice actor. You don't get to see her pretty face too often. But here she is in this movie. And uh, I always think she's funny. Yeah, well, I never saw, saw her in my life. But she comes up uh, in the superhero count, as do, you know, fucking 12 of she's, this count. She's also the voice of Buttercup and the Powerpuff Girls. So I hope that's the superhero count you're referring to. Um, she does a lot of shit for Nickelodeon. And uh, also briefly played Phoebe's singing partner on one episode of Friends. That's fun. We also get Danny Trejo. And... Oh, oh, right, oh, right. oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, oh. Wow, he just had an orgasm. Well, not about Danny Trejo, about his great... Well, Danny Trejo is hired as a... Um... What is it like? Uh, what do you bounty call it? Hunter. bounty hunter, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love again that that William Forsythe in this fucking two horse town needs to find bounty hunters to find these people. It's fucking hilarious. It's weirdly the same uh, uh, premise as another forty eight hours. Is it? Because he oh, hired yeah. like backup bounty hunters. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Henry, so, uh, yeah, Danny Trejo, sure. We love him. We know him. Machete. There's yeah, his yeah, beautiful things. face. But let's talk about his bounty hunting partner, Mr. Diamond Dallas Page, Henry. Yeah. Let's... Are you familiar yeah. with this very fine wrestler slash actor slash yoga instructor? <laughs> <laughs> makes all That all makes sense. He's after my time. Okay. So why don't you go ahead? All right. Well, it does have a special place in my notes. Mm -hmm. It's me. It's me. It's DDP. Let's talk about him. <laughs> he, um, good God. He, listen to me. He's in the WCW for a reason. He was not a wrestler. He was WCW head of whatever, Eric Bischoff's neighbor. OK, and he was okay. a very charismatic man and they used the same gym, I think. And and Eric Bischoff was like, maybe I'll just get my neighbor to be a wrestler. Oh, so he brings in Diamond Dallas Page because he's a maniac and he decides I can't wrestle. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> um, I can't improvise on the spot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choreograph to the letter every match I ever do before I do it. Okay? okay? Okay. Um so other wrestlers hate working with him. But they put him in the ring and he gets over Henry. He's a huge star in the WCW, becomes Diamond Dallas Page, one of the top men in the business. He's got his right? great finishing move, the diamond cutter. Okay. All right. Then when the WWF uh, purchased the WCW, um, he got shunted off into a storyline where he was stalking The Undertaker's wife, um, and so he couldn't get over with the WWF audience. But here's what happened after his wrestling career, Henry. He hmm. forms DDP Yoga, which is one of the top yoga things in the world, studios or whatever. Then he is responsible... Forgetting Jake the Snake Roberts sober. 
Really? He got Jake the Snake single-handedly, took him into rehab, made sure he stayed sober, worked with him, took him to meetings. Wow. Diamond Dallas Page is a fucking saint, and he could have done nothing in this movie and still been the MVP. Boy, uh, I don't know if I should feel bad about making him my LVP. Well, he's a horrible uh, actor, right? Yeah. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, he's my LVP. <laughs> he's not actually going to be my MVP, but he's certainly not going to be my LVP because he is a prince among men. Okay, well, I didn't know that about Jake. That's that's pretty nice. I know Jake had a hell of a rough time. I I feel like I've watched like three fucking documentaries or shows where he's just continuously coming sure. off, falling off. Including the great Beyond the Mat. Oh, uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, DDP saved his life. Jake the Snake Roberts is alive today. Because of Diamond Dallas Page, my friend. All right. Just hope he doesn't watch this movie. He might fall off the wagon again. Uh, he might. I think he enjoyed his appearance in this film. They call him the Unholy Two. Yes. Great yes. name for these of course. great characters. And uh, they break in and uh, shoot up a bunch of people. You know, the Firefly family is distracted at this point because they've all, like, dispersed to go fuck their own prostitutes. Right. Yeah. Mosley's off with um with the voice of Tommy Pickles. They're boning down. Um baby, what's she doing in this? Oh man. I don't even know, man. I mean, cuz you know, that was another thing that was interesting like that that was I appreciated though. It was that Otis is like when Otis even shows like sexual inclination in this movie, you're just kind of like, "Oh, he's got Earthly desires. I, I I thought this was like uh, the spawn of Satan. So he he's very human after all. In in those ways, it was strange. It's like oh, he just wants to go to a whorehouse. Well, I think ultimately he's like a still a Charles Manson guy, and yes, uh, and those guys yeah. tend to get down. Just look at uh, at our old yeah. friend Vanguard. Yeah, I I yeah. haven't, but Keith, I know Keith what you Rainier. mean. Yeah. Yes, Vanguard. Yes. Vanguard. He's he got he boned down plenty with only the skinniest babies. Ugh. <laughs> God. I want to talk about Nexium more. Why aren't you letting me? Because I haven't watched it yet. Oh really? Oh I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh I forgot about that. I was referencing it with uh, Jason Anthony Harris on a previous episode. That's right. Yeah yeah yeah. Mm. I don't care. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, you know, there's that long, long sequence where William Forsyth has them all uh, trapped in the chairs and yeah. he's torturing them. And that's a good sequence. Forsyth is fucking fantastic. Yeah, and, he is. And I sort of like he, I feel like the, the Firefly family are willing to look pathetic in this scene, too. Like they're still like talking airs around like uh, William Forsyth and like trying to like see him intimidating and like they're gonna like kill his mother and rape her or whatever yeah and, and of course you know that they're not i mean you know that william forsyth his character is Wydell, i guess is gonna fuck up you know he's gonna fuck this up i mean the whole time he's got them it's like one of the very obvious classic examples of the talking villain except he's not really the villain and you know, you I was just waiting. That scene, though, it's it's like yes, yes, it, it's the no. centerpiece of the movie. Yeah, no, 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 I agree. I, it was just funny because it was just like just kill these motherfuckers already, and and you know he's not going to succeed. And it was a nice touch that he's drinking while he's doing it because you're just like, oh man, you're going to get sloppy. You're not going to be paying attention. It's seven months later. Like you get the sense throughout this movie that this man is still mourning his brother. Oh yeah. Death, and he's like on a rampage. Like he doesn't yes. do anything intelligently. So like no. the whole movie, you're just waiting for him to fuck up. And of course he fucks up at the worst possible time. You're right. Gets yeah. his ass killed. And then uh, we get that uh, extended outro set to Leonard Skinner's, incredible song free bird um that you'd be lucky to hear at any concert well you'd be lucky to go to any concert at this point i would go to any concert right now <laughs> <laughs> i have never in my life thought i'd hear a day where you praised leonard skinnard i love leonard skinnard listen do you I'll have you know that I was in a band called the Superlatives briefly in high school, and we covered—I was the drummer, Henry, 
and we covered uh, Tuesday's Gone at a talent show. Is that right? That's right. They've got some good songs. I've covered them myself. Uh, I just It's hard for me to get How over that. I, you Stars used, and bars. Henry used to be in a wedding band um, where <laughs> he w- would perform lots of covers of classic rock hits. How many songs from these two movies have you covered Oh, live? my God, dude. Because I thought a, it must be at least three or four. A lot. Yeah. And, I mean, I must have done or rehearsed at least two to 300 songs in that band. And, and there was a lot of Southern rock. Uh, some of it I thought was great. Some of it was tough. Uh, I don't remember if it's this movie or the next movie, but at the Allman brothers, midnight rider mm-hmm. did that one. I, I, that, I think that was the song that I had that thought during. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I knew um, you covered we, that. And I did Skinner. Um, you did yeah. sweet home Alabama, right? We did that, and we did uh... fuck. There's a, a really famous. Can one. I can I what? say some things about that band? Am I allowed to say, Henry? Am I allowed to say the name of that band? And am I allowed to say the song you covered that I was most amused by? I don't say the name of the band. Okay, but you can say anything else you like. Okay, yes. great. One time, I went to go see them play a great outside oh, show. Yeah. It was, I know it was, it was fantastic. It was very fun. But it was actually a fun time. Yeah. No, it was super fun. But the greatest moment for me, awful, was when I got to go see Henry Papali playing some guitar over. Santana featuring Rob Thomas presents Smooth Baby. And I was loving every second of it. Henry's up there. And meanwhile, I'm out there. Henry's got like a nine year old niece. I yeah. paid her like five bucks just so <laughs> she could like dance like an asshole in front of Henry during that song. It was incredible. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, boy, I think you got her age right too. I think she was nine at, at the, the time. time. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, yeah. I knew that. Yeah, uh, yeah. I did not. I hate that song. I didn't want to play that song. We we. I that was. I made a lot of money out of that band. That was the. That was the caveat with that arrangement, as Dan knows well. I I got paid very well, mm-hmm. but I unfortunately had to play a lot of songs that I hated. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, there was a lot of a lot of classic rock going on in that in that group. All you could do, yeah. Henry, was try your best. You know, you gave it your heart, you made it real, and then you forgot about it. Yeah, fuck it, I didn't care. Yeah. Did you get that and, joke, Henry? Was that a lyric from those, something? Those were classic lyrics from the chorus of Santana featuring Rob Thomas's "Smooth." Those are lyrics from that song? Give me your heart, make it real, or else forget about it. Oh, yeah, very nice. Oh, God. Yeah. 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 I see see you just reliving that. I am, I am, because I'm trying to think of, like, some of the good bit. You know, we did some Almond Brothers, some Doobie Brothers, which was interesting, because I never listened to them in my life, but I liked a couple there. You forced them to do some ACDC. I, I certainly fucking did. I was not going to suffer through all that shit. Uh, but I didn't get away with that for very long. We <laughs> You did like a Black Keys song. There were some modern songs mixed oh, in. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think you Black did a Keys. White Stripes song, maybe? I, I wanted to do the White Stripes. That was not allowed. Did I you wanted... do like Hash Pipe by Weezer? Yes. That was me, obviously. I we did hash pipe. I wanted to do Seven Nation Army, but I couldn't convince anybody. Oh, it's only the most popular rock and roll song of the last twenty years. But sure, let's ignore that one. It was a tough group for me to be in. Well, all the I, dudes in the group were like twenty years older than you. And it was very hard for me to get my foot in, saying, "Well, actually, this is a very, very famous song." But yeah, yeah, you can go to literally any sporting event in the world and hear people chanting that song. But I don't think enough people are going to know it. Uh. Fucking really irritating, dude. Very, very irritating. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I do want to say that I appreciated in the Groucho Marx scene uh, all the great fuck yous to Elvis Presley. Those were funny. Of course, I agree. And uh, I because letting. 
a dumbass like the William Forsyth character say that he thinks the greatest artist in the world is Elvis Presley is is great confirmation to me that only dumb people like Elvis Presley. And if you told me that Rob Zombie likes Elvis Presley, I'd feel the same way. Well, I think he does, because I, I, again, took that as more... I saw William Forsyth being Rob Zombie there. Defending Elvis. Yeah, I did too, actually. 100%. That's in there for that. You're supposed to be like, yeah, fuck yeah, that's right, the fucking king. But I wasn't. I was like... Boy, I agree with the movie critic. I'd take Groucho Marx over Elvis Presley any fucking day of the week. Yeah, that's pretty easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, in the in Three from Hell, you see them watching the Three Stooges, which I think makes a lot more sense for their personalities. Like the Groucho is too evolved for them; they would be more into the Three Stooges. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, agreed. All right, H Dog, what do you give the Devil's Rejects? I give it two. Two? Now walk me through that grade. Sure. Why not a one? Why not a three? Okay. Uh, Not a one because it's clearly an improvement in in vast ways in every conceivable cinematic measure over the first movie. Um, It's just that for me, there's too much in it that is extra fat that doesn't seem to really cohere. I didn't really need the brothel stuff at all. The whole Charlie character seems frivolous to me. Um, I had, I, I liked what he did with the characters, but I just, at the end of the day, just didn't get any kind of real story out of it. And if this was a standalone movie, I think I would have felt different. But well, you know that's the, that's sort of, of as it is a part of a franchise. It's very hard for me to divorce it from the first one. I do find the third movie easier to divorce from the first movie, um, but it just didn't make a three star for me because I just didn't like it. I mean, on a personal level, I mean, I did think it was way. I'd watch it any day of the week. Over, I mean, I'll never watch thousand corpses again ever 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 but i and i don't want to watch this again but i could you know i will watch this again in my life this will be the one of these three that i reach for in my in my time yeah it's interesting what you say is that they tried to frame it that way around this time i remember like the reason (laughs) i felt comfortable seeing this movie having not seen the first one was that Rob and Sherry Moon wouldn't shut up in interviews about how, like, they see this as sort of, like, its own thing. We're going to take characters from that movie, but, like, now they're here. But then, I, if that's the case, then why didn't they just do that? Why not just take the same actors and, you know, re- I mean, why have any connection? Just completely make it well different. i think what i think they were trying to appeal to as many people as possible henry and that like they want the house of a thousand corpses heads to to come see this so they're gonna say it's a sequel to that movie but they're not gonna call it house of a thousand and one corpses they're gonna call it something else like, to get new people yeah, i think that's a fair point but i also think that rob zombie fans most likely will go see anything he puts out and i don't I think, think he was gonna now i think game. now they know that but this is only his second film yeah they but didn't he's, know the brand he, loyalty that rob zombie has i i'm just assuming there was carryover from his music career I mean, I just assume there's people who love him and are going to go see his but things. But there's a no million what. successful musicians that have tried to break into movies and instantly failed. Yeah. I mean... I mean, Mariah Carey was fucking huge when Glitter came out and nobody saw it. And they made him a fucking mistake because that movie's incredible. I <laughs> knew you were going to say that and I haven't seen it, but uh, she was one of my earliest crushes in life. Of course and she I, was. I believe... I- <laughs> Why is it? Why is it? Of course, she was because she was an angel in the early nineties. Uh, yeah. Everyone had a crush. She was one of my earliest crushes. Yeah. Yeah. Are you kidding me? That fucking Her, fantasy video. Paula Abdul. She was a, a crush of yours. Oh, I could watch uh, Opportunity. What was that video Opposites with the cat? Attract? Did Opposites you attract. watch that video wishing you were MC Scat Cat? Yes. 
Yes. Brother. Janet Jackson as well. Janet Jackson uh, and Madonna. I believe those were my four first musical crushes. All the, maybe all J- the pop success. Maybe. Yeah. And I was just going to say maybe Joan Jett. What about Cindy and, Lauper? Were you into her? Oh, not at all. <laughs> what about Susie Sue? No. All right. Blondie. Uh, blonde, yeah. Deborah. Harry. Deborah. Yeah. Henry, uh, who's your MVP? William Forsyth. Bill Forsyth gets the old MVP award. I understand it. Yeah. Uh, it's tough for me. Uh, is it? it is, yeah. I, I could just say Sid Haig again, I guess. Yeah, but come on. No, let's get interesting with it. Maybe, maybe I want to go with Jeffrey Lewis. I thought Jeffrey Lewis is great in this movie. I thought you'd maybe go with... Mosley? Yeah. You only feel that way because part of you wants to go with Mosley. No, I have room for that. Uh, he was my LVP in, in Thousand Corpses. I know. Which... He's definitely most improved. He wins that superlative. Yeah, he does win that. Absolutely. Not to mention my high school band with the superlatives. Right, Again, of course. You know, yeah, so I'm not trying no, to no, plug no, my no, 11th no, grade no, band, no, the superlatives. Yeah, yeah. You know, no big deal. Yeah. We had a no big... Silver Rain, but whatever. <laughs> um, Silver Rain! That was the only song I sung on, bro. Oh, God. All I right. didn't come up with the title. I want everyone to be clear on that. Mike Rom, our guitarist, our lead guitarist, came up with the title. Silver Rain! <laughs> You watched you pound me in the night. No, he came up to me one day. He was like, I have a great idea for a song. I've got a riff and a title. You come up with the rest. That sounds like a guitarist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was great, Mike Rob. He was into John Mayer, Jack Johnson, all the greats. Oh, boy. Mm-hmm. Henry, huh. you want to... Oh, who's your LVP? Well, you didn't even say your MVP, really. Uh, I went with Jeffrey Lewis. Oh, all right. You are sticking to that. Yeah. All right. My MVP is William Forsyth. My LVP is Diamond Dallas Page. He is bad. But even after the information. <laughs> yeah. Right. That I'm I only gave you. Thing, not his bio. Okay. No. Okay. But I want you to know that in this film. He is already working to get Jake the Snake Roberts sober. Uh-huh. Jake the Snake probably visited the set of this movie. That would be not a good idea. With all <laughs> You're probably right. To stay sober. All right. Uh, who's your LVP? I just said Diamond it. Dallas yeah. Page. I'm going to go with... Boy, I mostly like everyone in this movie. Yeah. You know who I don't really like? And I'm so sorry to say this. I'm moving out tomorrow. I'm still getting phone calls about uh, people wanting my apartment. I'm like, leave me alone. Yeah, that's why I turn off my notifications. Mm -hmm. Phone calls? You turn off your phone call notifications? Yes, all of them. Everything. Yeah. What about Matthew McGrory, who died at 32 the year this came out, and the film is dedicated to him? He saves him at the end, right? Yeah. I That'd just feel like this is Rob Zombie, like, oh, look, it's a f- big freak. Yeah, well, he definitely likes doing that. He also has a big freak as Charlie's friend in the brothel. I guess that's true. I don't know, dude. Uh, there's there's no one that bad in this movie. I'll, I'll go with uh, uh, Ginger Lynn. Okay. Because <laughs> why not? Okay. Ginger Lynn. Yeah, we also didn't mention Daniel Roebuck shows up. The, oh, yeah. The great PJ Souls from Halloween showed up for a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She gets laid out in the cement. Yeah, yeah. In, that, in that parking lot with her daughter. PJ, Rob over here. You got a couple hours. Come over to the set. I'm making a movie. No, you don't have to do anything. You just have a little kid. You just get, you, well, you get punched in the face, you know, but it's pretty baller. So. I assumed that. It's a Rob Zombie movie. So your game? Always. All right. Great. See Henry, you there. three from hell. Wait. Whoa. 
Oh, superhero count, right? Yeah. You're gonna fucking listen to it if I had to do it. <laughs> Kyle, my friend, only for you, pal. Only no, for... no, no, no. Hurry the fuck up. Don't don't make this a bit where you're gonna go real slow. I, I don't want to because I, I want to get we... through this. So do I. I. I actually had an end time in mind, but that's not gonna happen. Um, William Forsyth was Flat Top in Dick Tracy. He was also Dutton in Marvel's Dare, Daredevil, and I don't remember him in the Marvel Netflix series. Ah, oh, there's but, like a million like mob yeah. guys on that show. Yeah, Ken Foree. Hey, played- you know now the Daredevil rights have reverted back to Marvel, and um, there's been a bit of a fan outcry, including from Mr. Vincent D'Onofrio himself, to revive the television series. So look, look out for maybe some news on that. Oh, my goodness, I will. Thank you. It's the best news I've had all day. That's not a joke. <laughs> uh, Ken Forey, of course, played the infamous Whisper in the 1990s series The Flash. Well, why the not? Beat the Clock. E.G. Daly, uh, she was in The New Batman Adventures as a thrift store manager voice. She's going to be she a million would- voices. Yeah, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, she played Quarks. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Avengers, Earth's Mightiest Heroes, she played Mockingbird. Sure. She played Moonstone in Avengers Ultron Revolution. (gasps) Ooh, Henry, I just realized I looked up Ken Forey. You know what I know him from? He played Kenan's dad on the Nickelodeon sitcom Kenan and Kel. All right. So if so you ever want you to see Keenan's dad in something, check out The Devil's Rejects by Rob Zombie. I'll keep it in uh, in mind. Great. F- lastly, E.G., uh, whatever her name was, yep. Daily, she played Prairie Dog in Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. There did, you go. Did you bring up her Incredibles work? No, it's not uh, from a comic book. Well, that's a superhero thing, and uh, she, in all of the non, uh, like, actual movies like all like video games cartoons that kind of shit yeah she does elastigirl the Hollywood all right what well, and to be fair i do count i have counted the incredibles many times before so that might have been why i didn't include it because it's not on a regular filmography so okay she can do Danny? this voice pretty good a great uh, oh i could do an impersonation this is me eg daily i'm doing an impersonation of the great actress holly hunter all right, we got a ways to go. All right, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to blow through it. And I'm Danny, making great bits left and right here. I'll, I'll let it happen. It doesn't bother me. Uh, Danny Trejo played Harold in The Crow, Wicked Prayer. He played Ox in The Spectacular Spider-Man. He played Bane in Young Justice. He does get the big voice roles. He plays the Newt. Take control, Gotham. Take control, Gotham. That's right. The Neutralizer in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. N-E-W-T. Yeah. Neutralizer. He's in the new series, The Flash, that Dan loves. He plays a character called... It. Yeah. <laughs> he plays a character called The Breacher. Oh! He's an important character. Oh, yeah? Is he? Yeah, I, right, yeah. One of the um, characters on that show has a girlfriend from an alternate universe... And um, Danny Trejo plays her father. And he's oh, yeah. Breacher. In three yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All he's right. good. Brian Posehn was in Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer, unseen by me, as the wedding minister. I remember that. Yeah, a little cameo. Okay. Michael Berryman, who was the uh, hypohydrotic ectodermal dysplasia actor uh, who played Charlie's... Uh, ugly sidekick in the brothel he was in the crow as the skull cowboy next we move on to remembers the skull cowboy man say no more and i think his scenes are deleted um (laughs) chris ellis who played cogs in the devil's rejects i think that was one of the cops but i do remember this actor now because he played father riley in the dark knight rises 
He's the guy who owns the orphan or runs the orphanage that Bruce Wayne has let neglected. And all the great scenes with JGL. So that's oh, what you... sure. Yeah. Everyone remembers those JGL scenes. Yeah. From the Dark Knight Rises. Standing that's on you... a bridge. I remember. That's right. That's right. Mary Warrenoff, who played Abby, one of the, I believe, uh, I believe one of the hookers in the brothel. She played welfare person in Dick Tracy. Welfare person. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe she was seen in like one of Warren Beatty's big glowing neon sets. What, wait, wait, wait. wait. Who's this actress? What does she look like? Mary Warrenoff. Uh, she was. She is now the ripe old age of seventy-seven. So I guess she was about sixty something in the uh, Devil's Rejects. Okay, I'm looking at her right now. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Okay. Daniel Roebuck, of course. Yeah, uh, you can remember him as Arst from uh, the first season of Lost. Or our coverage of The Fugitive, where he's one of Tommy Lee Jones' deputies. That's right, and U.S. Marshals. He came back. That's right. He played Herkimer Johnson in Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman, and John Donnelly in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Oh, here's a good one. Oh, my God. I hope this is a good one. Tyler Maine was in this movie. He was? I believe he was Rufus in the opening sequence of the shootout in the house. He's the, the other brother who's like doesn't talk. Yeah, that was Tyler Maine, Sabretooth from right. the from the Singer and Ratner X Men films. That is correct. Um, what a great and- actor! God, I'm so glad they got Tyler Maine for those movies. He's <laughs> like a real Ray Park. Like you see his name, he's just like known for like a, a movie that was supposed to launch his career and didn't. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Kane Hodder. <laughs> no, Kane Hodder was in this movie. We've now yeah, reached he... the Kane Hodder era of the Firefly family trilogy. Yeah, Kane Hodder and Diamond Dallas Page look alike. I might add, Kane Hodder. Uh, wow, they look. Kane alike. Kane Hodder wishes. They look a lot alike. It's kind of scary. Wishes he looked like DDP. Yeah. He played an officer with a gas mask in the movie. I, I think there were lots of those. He played uh, Fallon's bodyguard in the feature film with Ben Affleck called Daredevil. No one cares. He's just Jason. And one more to go. Robert Trebber, who played Marty Walker in this movie, played the harried man in the taxi in the great Alec Baldwin vehicle, the 1994 The Shadow. Oh, my God. Really? We needed to know that shit? We didn't, but that's what was asked of me. Fuck you, Kyle. Hey, listen. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the three from hell. <laughs> Let's talk about it. Zombies back. It's 14 years oh. later. This film was released as a Fathom event on September 16th, 2019. You ever go to a Fathom event? You already know the answer to that. Is it what, enough? What, what, what are they now? What are you talking about? You ever go to like... Uh, a movie theater and you see like before the trailers come on, you know, and they're showing commercials for other shit. Yeah. Sometimes you'll see a trailer and it's like the castle of Cagliostro by yeah. Hayao Miyazaki. Visit okay. it for one night only. A fathom oh, event. Sure. sure. Oh, sure. They did it with a, they did it with a while for go- with Ghostbusters. I remember the original Ghostbusters. They do it with lots made. of stuff. You'll see it. They'll do it. Riff tracks we're doing riff tracks on glitter come for riff tracks and uh a lot of um like opera and shit too oh a fathom event one night only verdi's masterpiece aida yeah Yeah. correct (laughs) aida yeah (laughs) (laughs) fucking basic bitch Uh, Uh, elephants and shit man that's why i said aida great three from hell uh We've got a budget of $3 million lower than the first two. Uh, and they managed to take in $2.2 million. <laughs> okay. Uh, came in at number 179 at the box office there. Um, right, It made slightly less than a re-release of Gone with the Wind in 2019. Okay. And, Some other white trash spotter. Mm-hmm, and it did slightly better than something called Total Damal. Which I think is a Bollywood film. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, great stuff. Uh, you ever seen a Bollywood film? 
Yeah, you know, drunk. You watch a few minutes. <laughs> I'm not gonna sit through an entire Bollywood film. They're like four hours long, and they dance around yeah, and shit. And there are a lot. I saw Slumdog Millionaire. I fucking hated it. I'm not like searching further into the genre. Uh, I too. If anyone yeah. could tell me like a Bollywood film that I could watch as like a fan of film and like appreciate, like this is a good fucking film, I'll watch it. They do a lot of remakes of American films too. I know, you know there's a like, there's a what women want I know that much. Oh boy. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of everything. They they redo a lot of them. Anyway. All right, let's go. All right. So uh you got uh 3 from hell. 1 2 3. Now, you might remember in the first two movies in this franchise, there were like three main characters. You got to go with Sid Haig, you'd say, the clown, the clown. Then right. Bill Mosley, the Rob Zombie cosplay guy. Then Sherry Moon Zombie, the woman. Correct. Okay. Now, what this movie does is they seize on your nostalgia for the first two movies by calling the film Three from Hell. Yeah. Clearly referencing three characters that you know and love and presumably want to see on screen again 14 years later. Presumably. they give one of those characters one scene. Okay? Now, I understand Sid Haig was dying, okay? Yeah. And, in fact, on screen, uh, I believe that uh, he may be dead already. I'm not sure that they filmed it in time. All right, Henry? (laughs) He's laughing over there, but I'm being serious. (laughs) Because I knew before you even spoke that was going to be what you said yeah i uh i have to agree with you i actually felt bad it was one of those scenarios where i was looking at the screen and i i, I you shit should be you not he should be at right home yes I, I i i shit you not i i have nothing against Sid Haig personally at all. I just, and I, you know, I know I've not a big fan like Bell's, but I literally was looking at the screen like, Rob Zombie, you fucking unethical bastard. This guy needs to be in the ICU. Yeah, at least when um, Paul Thomas Anderson put Jason Robards in Magnolia, he was lying in a prone position the whole film. <sighs> yeah, he could be comfy. And he didn't die right after that movie anyway. He died pretty much right after that movie. I don't think he did. Pretty sure. I, I thought he lived a couple of years. Mm, no more than a year. Oh, uh, should we look it up? Sure. Yeah, because I thought Rob, I thought that was always the misconception that like, oh, he's playing what he knows because he's dying anyway. But no, he wasn't. That, it's not a misconception. It's a conception. I don't. Uh... He died in two thousand, one year after the film came out. All right, but he could have been, you know, hit by a bus for all we know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. He, okay, uh, uh, let me check my notes. Looks like metastasized <laughs> lung cancer. Yeah, great. <laughs> and then he had it, he beat it, and he whacked in front of a bus. <laughs> you yeah. dumb motherfucker. Jason <laughs> Robards. What is he, fucking Nick Cage in City of Angels? <laughs> oh, Lord. Yeah, you're right. PTA at least gave him, like, Jason, you don't, you don't have to do gave much. Gave him some fucking him. blankets, bro. Oxygen. Yeah. yeah. Real-life ICU nurse right there, right behind PSH. Yeah. All right. So uh, the last film that came out in 2005 ends with them... Um, meeting a roadblock full of police officers and getting gunned down. Um, I always assumed that they died and that was the end of it, but uh, Rob Zombie then, after he finished making his two Halloween films, uh, he, none of his films were really catching on, so he, he needed to revisit the characters. Yeah! yeah. But and he what, acknowledges... Okay, I'm sorry. What I'm no. saying is... If you're a filmmaker and you want to revisit an old franchise and the franchise pretty much only has three recurring characters in it, Mm -hmm. if one of them is unable to come to set and that's kind of the most popular one, I would argue don't make the movie. (laughs) Just don't make the movie. 
Make a different movie. Make with a different, different characters. Movie. That would have a different idea, though. A different construct. No, I don't wouldn't. Know. All his movies are the same. Well, that's what I'm, I know, but I don't know if he has that. Just create in, a new set of him. maniacs. Yeah. With well, younger people and his wife, probably. Right. Younger people and his wife. Yeah. Who's only like seven years older than me, so. Chris Hardwick would probably say yes to that at this point. Fucking yeah. He's he's having some tough days. <laughs> Look, I gotta this is gonna be a quick episode of Talking Dead. I'm really sorry. I gotta I'm I'm shooting a movie over there on C Lot uh with Rob Zombie. It's gonna be great. He still does the talking you know, I don't watch The Walking Dead anymore, so I guess I, I don't, don't pay attention. I guess he still does it, right? I, I quit. That's all he I got. Do. I quit a couple years ago, so I don't know. Yeah. I wonder if DDP was ever in an I quit match. I mean, that's an entire, entirely uh, possible thing to have happened. Um, maybe we should cover it. If, uh, if DDP's ever been in an I quit match, maybe we should cover it on the Patreon. I'll do it. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing today. Ah, it's fine. <laughs> All right. So, so I, I say don't make the movie. You've got Bill Mosley, a character who is uh, watery at best, was a pretty much different character from movie one to movie two. You've no. got your wife, who's going to be in any movie you make anyway, so it's not exactly a fucking reunion. And okay. So what's exciting about this movie for people? Like, fans of those first two movies <clears throat> who, like, got to that amazing ending of that second movie get to be told... Like, what happened didn't actually happen. They survived. They've been in jail for the whole time. And now you're going to watch another movie um, without one of the three characters you like? Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. So they each we get the explanation that they survived, and they each got 20 bullets each. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a lot of bullet wounds. Um. Personally, I don't think you could survive that, but I don't know much about bullet wounds. Um, but I like this film more than the other two. I knew you were going to say that, and um, I think that's stupid of you, Henry. I think you're going to come across stupid in this episode. Oh, am I? Yeah, because this oh, is a I... really terrible film. Yeah, well, thank you, first of all. Thank you very much. Uh I don't care how, how, how I come across. Uh -huh. uh, I, I put off and I put an effort here. And uh, I uh, this film is slightly less cruel. And I don't think it's uh, as quite as stupid as the other ones. OK. And I don't think that just, you know, I don't because Sid Haig isn't in it. I think it's fine. I also don't see a problem with Richard Brake. You seem to. Well, um, I mean, it would be interesting if they gave him, like, um, a unique character, but having him play just, like, a watered-down Sid Haig for one hour and 55 minutes. Yeah, it's very long. It's very long. Uh, it's just a road movie. It's just like the other two. There's nothing special about it uh, at all. But there but is this something is the most, special this is the about most The Devil's Rejects. I disagree. I... I, I did not think so. I think it was very, very recycled stuff. And I don't think that this is necessarily not recycled stuff, but I found this to be eminently more watchable. But they're recycling boring shit in this movie. Well, to you. you like, know, what's and... exciting? Describe the movie. Tell me what you liked. <laughs> First of all, you're going to come across as stupid, just so you know that. It's very big confidence builder for me to start uh, reviewing. Oh, the movie. Yeah, that, that's my job on the show to big up your confidence. Uh, <clears throat> no, um, I just I, I thought that it had a very simple story. It had it had some settings that I liked. Mexico? I wasn't. That's correct. I liked this. The prison stuff. I thought that was all right. I'm not giving this a rave review, by the way, motherfucker. But uh I uh, I just it didn't really I feel like it was the uh, like Devil's Rejects was really trying attempt and I know you like this in movies even when I think it fails uh, aiming swimming swinging for the fences and this movie's not doing that it's just a simple goofy stupid movie 
with these three characters. It's a jail breakout. They have they've been followed by cops. It's not three characters. Now, it's two characters and a place filler. Okay. Are you gonna let me answer your question? Go ahead. And then they're pursued once they get to Mexico by, you know, the Black Satan uh, gang, which is which is pretty dumb. Uh, but it also gave the movie more room. I thought some the dialogue between a lot of the characters I thought was better. I thought Bill Mosley in particular was better in this movie than he was in the previous two. Uh, I also liked, I thought Sherry Moon Zombie was better in this movie. There are different set pieces in this movie that I liked. I liked the knife throwing contest. I liked when she takes the crossbow and there's a great shot of her coming up from behind on the table with the crossbow. I thought there was some stuff in this movie that was entertaining. And I was not particularly entertained. Well, I wasn't at all entertained by the first movie. And the second movie I just found tedious. And I thought this movie was not tedious. No, this I was, it was tedious. totally I, I fine. Felt, I felt like I was watching, uh, like uh, th- this this movie. I feel like dismissing it entirely, just out of hand. Like that's this, how I felt this, about the first movie. This fucking movie. This isn't art. This isn't entertainment. This is nothing. This is fan service for a group of dumb fans. Like I I I, I watched Jay and Silent Bob reboot that piece of shit. And there's about as much here. It's just for the most hardcore fans to J.O. over. There's I, nothing going on here. It's, I'm it's, sure. It starts out with like a bunch of found footage. They're trying to make it look like grainy in an 80s VHS style rather just than— Just like the second one. Just like the second the one. The second one is going for like a grainy 70s style. <laughs> It, okay. And and doing it in a way that seemed authentic to me, whereas this just looked like I was watching Stranger Things or something. Well, this is just a movie. I mean, the, I think the second one. See, that was a big problem with me with the second movie is that you bought, you felt it was authentic, and I did not. I felt it was very inauthentic, and I, I this was just just much simpler. And I guess that it was the least torturous Rob Zombie experience I've had of the five movies. Yeah, I've Yeah, because seen it's it. the most boring. Like that's the thing with you, Fine. Henry. Like I do, I li- I like a little bit of fucking ambition. And what you I like is just like argue. you you just want something to be inoffensive. When I'm dealing with someone like Rob Zombie, who I do not consider a good filmmaker, but you do. I don't. I uh, the only movie of his I like is The Devil's Rejects. I'm not interested in 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 getting much out of it. This has been a pretty big slog for me to watch these but, movies. But then, and how was this the most diff- the, the easiest one to get through? It's by far the longest. Because I just didn't feel it like that. I didn't feel it. It's not. It doesn't have as much ludicrous, over the top bullshit. No, in it, it doesn't. It has nothing. It has no ideas. The, the the previous no. films, like, no matter what you say about them, like, in every scene, they're throwing something at you. You may like it, you may not, but it has an idea. In this movie, it's such a fucking slog. We go down to Mexico, it, it, and we're just looking at this, like, cartoon gang with, like, Rob Zombie knows, like, four things about Mexico— and he places half the movie there. It's, we spend over an hour in Mexico, and we never see anything but Day of the Dead-looking motherfuckers, luchadors, and whores. True. And that's not uh, a movie. Well, you also spend the first half in prison. No, you spend and like the first 20 minutes in prison, which is no, by far the best part of the movie. That's not true. And it's all and again, what I was telling you about Devil's Rejects, the parts of it I liked were having the different settings and seeing how he filmed them. And I thought that the prison stuff in this movie, while still repulsive, because I find most of his movie making just repugnant anyway, was still a nice change of pace. And the goofy fucking warden and all that stuff. I did not mind that. I did not think it was that terrible. Uh, think about it from a I, plot level, though, Henry. Like, yeah. th- they're well, in- that's ludicrous from a plot level, but they're all ludicrous from a plot level. All of them. You know that. 
I mean, how is this any more ludicrous than the other two movies? The, the, moving beyond House of a Thousand Corpses, which is ludicrous Fine. and a Fine. movie I think is bad, like Fine. this movie, they're asking you to accept that at the end of the previous movie, th- you have to do so many mental gymnastics to even watch this movie. I did anyway. Like, you have to accept they survived at the end of the previous movie. They got right. away. Uh, it says that they were shot a hundred times and they survived. So fine. Maybe there's something supernatural. Maybe they're from hell or something. Um, I can accept yeah. that, I guess. Right yeah. Then they're in prison. They get broken out. Great. Who do they get broken out by? A previously unmentioned relative who all of a sudden becomes hugely important to this movie where he gets equal screen time to the other two stars. How is that not the biggest fucking deus ex machina in the world? You introduce a family of like 12 maniacs, you kill off like 10 of them, and then like two of them are left in prison, and then your solution to that is, oh wait, there was a 13th. Everything that you said is true, but again... Who cares? Like, were you, I was not when he. So he introduces. I'm watching uh, it as a movie. I am too, and I'm watching it. Richard Brake come in there, and I'm just like, yeah, all right, completely believable that they have another relative that I haven't met. Who cares? Like, of course, why wouldn't they? That's a stretch for you to believe that there's another relative it's out there. It's not a I mean, stretch I don't even for me, but it's it, it's uh, it, an impossible coincidence in the context of this movie. I didn't feel that way at all. It just it was just what it was. It they was cut totally... to Bill Mosley being broken out of prison and like he's got like a helper with him and I'm like, Oh shit, is that Sid Haig? No, it's not. It's some fucking guy. Yeah. A totally, totally. uninteresting character who you're just gonna be stuck with for the next two hours. Well, I mean, at that point... He's window I... dressing. He's fulfilling the title. That's all he's doing. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's hard for me to argue with any of that, but, like, I guess I don't care passionately enough about it to defend all so, that. So, this, mean, is, this, so this is the thing you're, you're looking at, is, like, I liked the second movie, so I would like this film to make sense. That's all I'm asking for from this movie, is to just... I would like it to make sense, and I would like to accept it in the context of the second movie. And it doesn't do that. This is, to me, an unentertaining two-hour fucking slog where you're just spending time with, like, the second and third best characters in a movie I watched 14 years ago and liked. Like, there is no reason for this movie to exist. It is worse than fucking Train Spotting 2. It is worse than Jane's Silent Bob reboot. It is absolutely utterly meaningless on a level I don't see in movies that often. Wow. I just didn't have strong feelings about it. I just didn't. I mean, I I think that has to be also contributed to the fact that I had no... You just don't give a shit. I had no prior stakes in the other movies, and I did not have any... Even though you hadn't rewatched Devil's Rejects in 15 years, it was clearly something that stuck with you. And so you have more of an attachment to that single movie, whereas I have ends, none. And it this ends is just beautifully. An, like I yeah. ju- like for you, yes. To me, it's like um, if uh, you did like a reboot of Six Feet Under, and it's like those characters that you all saw die at the end. They're all like two of them are alive now. The two you care about the least. It's like David's ex husband and. Uh, you, you know, um, Rain Wilson. No, and and uh, like Lauren Ambrose's bo- Ben Foster, that boyfriend guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, like those are the two characters. They're they're alive, and we're gonna do a Six Feet Under reboot I mean, where everyone else never died, but you don't see any of them. You're equating the universe that this movie takes place in to the Six Feet Under universe. I'm just, I mean, and, but it's an established universe with rules. Like you I know, don't think there are any rules. I think that's been very. I'm the only one on this show of the two of us who has never seen any of these three movies, and so for me, there aren't any rules. So therefore, when he presents shit to me, I 
don't it it can either it's not going to have a lasting effect on me. I'm not going to be looking at it like nothing in these movies are, is beloved to me. And it's not a matter of beloved. It's like you're reading a novel and then two thirds of the way through everyone dies. And then in the next section, it's like never fucking mind. And by the way, here's another random character. But that's how it's been for me since the beginning of this trilogy. So that's why this is not as much of a stretch for me. I, I, you know, watching these movies for me is much more of like, if he made a fourth one. Well, I think he intends to. The end of this fucking movie, which is a fucking abomination, ends with this ginormous shootout in Mexico that just looks like something out of a fucking Desperado movie. And it ends with them, like, walking off into the sunset together, like, we're badass, we're gonna make more movies. Totally. Completely. I totally agree with that. Yeah. But it's fine. I didn't care. I did not care, man. I am miserable that I have to cover another one of these pieces of shit on the show. And this movie was so fucking bad that it makes me think Rob wow. Zombie's a worse filmmaker than I thought. And I already thought yeah. he was a bad filmmaker. I never thought and he was good. So. He's all, I thought he's only made one movie, except now I think the movie I liked is worse in hindsight. Well, you had a, a bad experience doing it. It was unpleasant for me, too. Uh but obviously, I, I don't need to point out you're obviously wrong about saying I don't like ambitious movies. Uh, I just don't. You like easy stuff. Yeah, that's me. Uh, <laughs> I just didn't get into The Devil's Rejects like I think you wanted me to. No, no, no. I absolutely I, super don't care that you don't like The Devil's Rejects. I was expecting it too, and it was what I got. But I thought we were going to have fun talking about what a dumb Flashing piece of shit fun. this is. It is a dumb piece of shit. I completely but agree. To me, I'm not to me, to this, is, this is worse than, than both of the first two, and it's not fucking close. I don't agree. I don't agree at all. Yeah. And I saw people on Letterboxd giving this like threes and fours, and I think you're dumb. Well, I think what, if you give this a three or above, you're, you're dumb. Though. What your thing is, yeah, and you know? Kyle Padovano, I saw you did it. I think you're dumb. Well, that's your thing, man. You like to uh, demean people and call them dumb when they when they disagree with you. But it's uh, not a matter know. of disagree. Like people I, can disagree with me like 99 out of 100 times, and I don't give a fuck. But this movie, this isn't art. Like to me, this is the opposite of what movies should be. Okay, it's for I mean, nobody. It is it is it has no artistic purpose whatsoever. It is for a group of fucking mouth breathers that have been begging Rob Zombie to make this movie for the last fourteen years. That's all it's for, and the, the entire purpose of this movie is to revive Rob Zombie's directing career. Yeah, totally. That's not the purpose for a movie. That's not why you do a sequel. And that's why belated Three. sequels are never fucking good because they're for nobody but the mouth breathing douchebag shitty fans that don't know anything about art or what they need from a movie. They just know what will make them happy in that one second that they see it. Yeah. Uh, and seeing yeah. Sid Haig's decrepit face for two seconds, I guess, made them happy. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, for me, it's just uh, another uh, desert-soaked looking shoot 'em up uh, You're right about the Desperado thing. Uh, Desperado was being too kind. It looks more oh, like Once Upon a great. Time in Mexico. Desperado's great. And, uh, Once Upon a Time in Mexico is, is very terrible. Uh, and uh, But of the three movies, uh, for me, this, this was just... The only one that I could just kind of I didn't have to wince every 10 seconds at a line of dialogue or a visual constantly. And, you know, I, I had debated upon giving it a two. Um, but I really just think that, you know, I, I the I think it's also I think it's also felt felt to me a little bit in certain ways more and you might not, I don't think you like this because it isn't ambitious in any way. 
it did feel a little more linear and sure-handed to me. His actual directing style. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like when when guys are young and hungry and creating great art, and then they get old and fucking boring. You and need to stop calling this art all the way through. You can't keep using that word. I mean, he is not movies John. Movies are art. He is not John Carpenter. I would man. call you any can't... movie art. No, you wouldn't. You're not calling this art. I I think that Rob Zombie fancies himself an artist. I think if you'd ask Rob Zombie, he'd tell you that this is art. But I'm looking at this, and I see right fucking through him. Like, yeah, it is shorthanded. Yeah, like, technically, it might be a better made movie. It's not, though. It's not as well made as Devil's Rejects, because some of those fucking camera filters in the first half hour suck. And uh, the, 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 narration, camera filters, the narration's man. all fucking over the place. They're, like, the first 40 minutes of the film is exposition. Like, eat my ass. Who, who's that? That was, just, that me, line that of was dialogue? just me saying that. I want you to eat my ass. All right. I go no, to thanks. one. Are you going with a three? Wow. Uh, yeah, I am. Dumb motherfucker. I'm going what's with your, a three. Who's your MVP? Bill Mosley. Bill Mosley, yeah. Um... Boy. Yeah. I didn't expect you to get so riled up. I felt like I, uh, Sherry Moon got worse. What happened there? <laughs> to me, she's just doing the same shit from the first two. She's fine. She's no better, no worse. I didn't really... I mean, I think she's all right. I found her annoying. What about that they, scene they, where she kills Sean Whalen at the fucking vending machine? That scene sucked. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Uh she, I mean, he gives her a lot of dialogue in she's this movie. She's the star of this movie. Yeah, she is. I mean, she's she's the number. I think she's probably got, probably got the most screen time uh, of anyone. Um, but Bill Mosley, you know, I thought I thought uh, he was the only actor that I was kind of like. I kind of wish I could see him in, and maybe there's something out there. Uh, see him in something like non horror. You know, where he, he, he gets to just kind of be himself. But I don't know when that's going to happen because he's like 70 years old. So I don't know. He might. Uh, my MVP. Jesus Christ. I'm going to go with Sylvia Jeffries. Uh, she she had the, the poor misfortune of being. She was taken out of a shower and forced to run around naked in this movie. And yes. I thought she acquitted herself okay. And. and... <laughs> I got to tell you, I didn't think watching this, you would have such a visceral feeling for it. And I think that also goes to... I was excited to watch it. I was into it yeah. for like a half hour. Yeah, because I... This also just goes to how we viewed the two things, whereas you looked at the second one as like this artistic achievement of some sort. Um, and I didn't. Whereas I thought you would just feel... You see such a marked difference between this and The Devil's Rejects. And I guess to me, I'm either blind to that or I just didn't care enough to see the marked difference. It doesn't seem that much different to me, despite the plot holes, which to me, again, continue out through the trilogy. I'm surprised, ultimately, that you saw such a disparity between the third movie and the second movie like such a glaring disparity in style tone substance and oh story. yeah this is not like the difference between season two and three of a show this is like when you watch season two and check back in and it's like season 15 and the show yeah. is still on the air and yeah. you're like who are all these characters what's happening yeah see and i didn't feel that this felt like i watched them a couple days apart and this just felt like an exact continuation for me and I, I don't know what to account for that, but it's that's how I felt. And I thought you'd kind of feel that way. No, I truly hated it. Who's your LVP? Yeah. <laughs> um, I was unsure about that. Um, I suppose my LVP might be just because he's just poorly again. I feel bad for this actor. Uh, typecast all the time. Um, Can you finish whoever, that sentence? No, I'm working on it. Because like you in the previous movie, I didn't have one. 
Um, Richard Edson. Yeah, Richard Edson. Um, people know as one of the guys. Well, he's in all the early Jarmusch movies. He's one of the leads in Stranger Than Paradise, and then he was he stole that um, car in um, Ferris Bueller. Ferris Day Bueller, off. yeah. Yeah, everyone knows him from that. He they tried to make him a little indie star in the early '90s. He got one lead role in a movie called Joey <laughs> Breaker, and the reason I know so much about Richard Edson is that I'm related to him. Get the fuck out of yeah, here! Yeah, he's like a second cousin or something. Really? Yeah, and so um, it was to my great surprise that I ran into him in this movie playing a character named Carlos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 2019, you're hiring the one of the ultimate Jews, Richard Edson, to play a Mexican character. If I'm not mistaken, they did that to him and Ferris Bueller, too. You might be right. In a worse way, like in a 1980s, all Mexicans work in fucking parking lots. Oh, really? Lots. I just remember him cars. being Jewish in that. I don't remember. He steals cars. He steals Ferris's car and takes I it for know. a joyride. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. he's awesome, and he gets it back in good shape. It's very true with the mileage having to be redone by Cameron. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, he's definitely an option for me for LVP. Well, the other one for me is going to be the drug dealer. Who's the drug dealer? Aquarius? can't find his fucking name. I think it's Aquarius. Emilio yeah. Rivera? Yeah, yeah. just because a lot have been there, done that with that. But, yeah, no, no, I certainly didn't need drug dealers or Mexican gangs in this movie. I thought I was tuning into a horror movie. I didn't think, I don't know that any of them are actual horror movies. This but, one definitely isn't. Uh, I don't oh. think anyone gets killed by anything other than a long-range shotgun. <laughs> um, so, yeah, he was an option for me for LVP. I would say D. Wallace in her role as the prison matron Greta was really fucking bad. I did not know that was D. Wallace until, like, I think I paused the movie to figure out, like, who is that? Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I did not I did not recognize her at all. Uh, you've got Jeff Daniel Phillips as Warden Virgil uh, with his hipster mustache and um, his never making a decent decision ever. A lot of this movie sort of felt like a fan so fiction weird. version of Orange is the New Black. Like I thought, this guy was like a version of like of porn stash from the first couple seasons yeah, of that show. I know who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and uh, I thought he was really bad. But I think the only answer for least valuable player, considering he takes up almost a third of the screen time in the film, is Richard Brake, who added zero value to the film whatsoever. Okay, wow. I haven't heard this level of vitriol in your voice in a while. Uh, I'm not a fan. But, I was you know, disappointed. <laughs> yeah, and in me too. But oh, well, I'm not disappointed in you. It's fine. I think this is a stupid opinion, like your like Jurassic World fallen whatever opinion. But um, you know, you'll come back from this. I have. I, <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty confident in my opinion here. Um, next time someone asks me if they should watch a Rob Zombie movie, I'm going to say no. But if you have to, watch Three from Hell. Just say no. Just do me a favor and say no and don't give no, them might, misinformation. I might, I might do that. You're like the Donald Trump of film podcasts. You ever say that to me again and we are, <laughs> we are, we are done. You're right. That was too harsh. We're, we're done. Mm -hmm. um, You're like the okay. Kelly McEnany of film podcasts. What's her name? Kaylee McKinney? Yeah, you know, who's like press secretary or whatever. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, right. She has but hot arm. You're the guy who, but you're the guy who just likes to put people down uh, ad hominem. So you are kind of more of a Trump type personality, I'd say. Just kind of like bullying type thing, I'd say. Whereas no, I'm no, no, no. I am. I would say that I'm more of a bully than you. But yeah, I think I, that. I, I think a different kind of a bully than a Trump. I'm more going oh. for like a, like a Cobra Kai kind of a thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is so full of shit. Just so our listeners know, I don't take any of this personally. I and think I don't mean any of it personally. I know that. After the I, podcast. Sometimes I feel like I want to reassure them, not me. I don't. Them, oh, not do you us. think they're feeling iffy about us fighting? 
I feel like they might. I don't We're know. We're not actually fighting. What happens is after the show, with the uh, important exception of the Superman Returns episode, um, Henry will say, <laughs> were you being serious? Uh, just to make sure. And I say no. And we make up. Or or the flip side happens and Dan worries that he has actually pissed me off. That's true. Sometimes I just instantly apologize to make sure. And then I have to say, no, it's fine. Yeah. Um, okay, Henry, uh, do you have a superhero yeah. count for us? Yeah, I'm really sorry that I do. Uh, yes, I, I feel like a guy in an elevator where someone is about to have diarrhea and I want to get out of that elevator as quick as possible, but I can't. How many times because... have you been in that situation? It's because you work in a hospital. Actually, none. <laughs> I've never been in that situation, but, uh... Have you ever been stuck in an elevator and had to go poopy? Me? Yes. Yeah. I've never been stuck in an elevator. Really? Sure. I guess yeah. I haven't either. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> Richard Brake. Of course, the great Richard Brake from Three from Hell. He elevates the film. <laughs> uh, Shut the played, fuck up. He played Joe Chill in Batman Begins. A very good Joe Who Chill. Forget? Who could I forget could, that I performance? Could. Very good. I don't know what you got against this guy. He was also uh, the Einherjar captain in Thor the Dark World. Now, that I did forget because I, I don't know what that is. I see here he was the Night King on the Game of Thrones. Oh, was he? King I of the Night. I probably dropped that at that point. Yeah. He was also the interrogator in Kingsman the Secret Service. Jeff Daniel Phillips, of course, uh, your your favorite. The played, Warden. Yeah, he played David Angar, which apparently is a character of some consequence in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Okay. Uh, yeah. Emilio Rivera was lobby guard in Venom, well, which I, surprised me because— well, I bet I noticed him. As a lobby guard, I really do pay attention to lobby guards in films and the way they are treated— by the residents of the building. And I gotta say, Henry, I would not want to be the lobby guard in a building that Joe Esterhaas lives in, because I have noticed that his characters do not treat lobby attendants very well. See right. Sliver for more info. Oh my. I don't like that. Mm -hmm. At that being said, I would like to work in a building with J.J. Abrams in attendance, because... I recently watched Regarding Henry, and I really enjoyed the way Harrison Ford treats his lobby attendant in that film. Yes, there's a common depiction in Hollywood I've, I've noticed, too, of upper-crust, really wealthy white people who generally treat doormen very well. Uh, see the undoing. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I didn't think they were particularly nice to that doorman. They're very nice. Donald Sutherland really likes this doorman. I guess. I, you know, they, they could give him a little more. How about in the film Living Out Loud when Holly Hunter bones doorman Danny DeVito? Oh. I guess I, I mean, wouldn't want to bone a resident. That would be... Oh, yeah, that'd be awful. The ultimate shitting where you eat. That'd be amazing. I mean, it would be amazing. You're fucking nuts. That'd be great. You, you're done? Stop you in the elevator, downstairs. maybe. Yeah, you just come downstairs, go back to work. It's great. That would be pretty dynamite. You don't have to ch take a subway. You don't have to do anything. You go upstairs. You come down. You're done. Police in the <laughs> great <Tim> advice. <laughs> Mila Rivera was also in Spider Man Three, a really shitty movie that Dan loved. Great loves. film. Great film. Much better than Three from Hell. Mm. He come paid on, it. It is. He paid. He paid a policeman and a sand truck. I assume that's in some sequence. Ooh, sand truck. I know what that means. I guess so. He was also a sleazy breeder in Birds of Prey. The new one? Yeah. Okay, so full title, please. Wait, I fucked that up. Sorry, that's not him. That's the next actor, David Urey, who played Travis O'Rourke in this movie, Three from Hell. I don't know who that is, Travis O'Rourke. He can is I, in Birds of can Prey. Can I get a full title on that Birds of Prey movie? I wish I could, but in the actual page, it doesn't tell you the full title. Wasn't this a movie they changed? Yeah, that they changed title? the title. It was yeah. like, what, the fantabulous just, yeah. resurrection of one Harley Quinn or something like that. Yeah. I'll probably watch that eventually. I will not. You, you will if... Uh, 
I think we could cover it with Suicide Squad on the show. Oh, that's true. Maybe we should. Uh, did, that would be kind of fun, actually. Dan's uh, family member, Richard Edson. Was he in a superhero of, thing? Yes, that he was. He was in Howard the Duck. Yeah, he playing was. Playing Richie. I'm Boy, gonna... this guy, he's very, very successful actor. I mean, yeah. he's been in a lot. Ferris Bueller, Desperately Seeking Susan, Good Morning Vietnam. I remember him in Good Morning Vietnam. Yeah. He's in Eight Men Out. Holy shit. Uh, Wade Williams was in Three from Hell. Uh, he's a big, dumb-looking motherfucker. And uh, he was in Batman Under the Red Hood playing Black Mask. That's a big role. And the warden at Blackgate in The Dark Knight Rises. And Harvey Dent in the cartoon Dark Knight Returns, Kyle. And... <laughs> <laughs> Are we done? And the prison guard in Venom. Can we please be done? Mantis and Batman, the Brave and the Bold, and Killer Croc and Beware the Batman. <sighs> Only one more. Sean Are Whalen. Are you fucking kidding me? There's more. Should have been me doing this. Sean Whalen. He's Burt Willie in Three from Hell. He's also in <laughs> Batman Returns. He's the guy a, that he, she kills at the vending machine. Right. And he's a paper boy in Batman Returns. He carves the word grape into his forehead because he was getting a soda. grape soda. That's not like anything that would happen in the other two dumb movies. All right. Got my last little twist in there. That's it. All right. You know, overall, I wish we hadn't watched any of these, but... Uh, it's okay. Me too. I wish that uh, I watched Devil's Rejects back in March and then waited another 10 years before watching it and never bothered to see this one. And I honestly, despite giving Three from Hell three stars, I honestly didn't need to ever watch any of these movies. But, you know, I, ca I can say that about quite a few things we've covered, I guess. Um, you, I would really. Would you rank them three, two, one? Yes. Okay, yeah, I figured. And you'd go two, one, three. Correct. Yeah. All right. Halloween, Halloween two better than three from hell. Um, the second one is. I think, I think they both that, are. I think I gave that one star. No, no, you liked the first one more than the second one. We disagreed. Yeah. On no, no. I thought you just said Halloween two was better. I okay. I do think Halloween two is better. Oh. Of the zombie ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Zombie ranking. So, well, it doesn't matter. This five. Who ones. gives a fuck? I don't. I was yeah. trying to be nice because he's an artist. I'll rank Dragula number one. <laughs> <laughs> Dig through the stitches and burn through the witches and The best he ever did was the video for Thunder Kiss 65. So that's no, just... the best thing he ever did was the animated interlude in Beavis and Butthead Do America. No, the okay, that's a good one. The best thing he ever did was SS Werewolves of London. Oh. In... <laughs> that is pretty good, dude. It's the best thing he ever did. That might be the best thing he ever did. Yeah, I mean, it's like three minutes at most, and that's what I need from Rob Zombie. Three and minutes. even in those three minutes, he had to invoke Nazis. Yeah, that makes sense. If yeah. we're not invoking Confederates, we're going to do the German equivalent of white trash. What's the best one of those? Werewolf women of the SS don't Ooh. or Thanksgiving. <laughs> Okay, in the theater, I definitely laughed the hardest when don't. Me too. But in yeah. hindsight, I love the idea of a Thanksgiving horror yes. movie. That, that visually was the best one. But and that's don't... the only one I would like to see a feature film out of. Yeah, well, don't's probably been done over and over and over and over and over. But that one really made me fucking laugh. I don't know why. Yeah, don't.